Welcome to Money Talks. I'm Genevieve Westcott with your latest financial news from across New Zealand and around the world. In this edition, it's all about Europe. They say a lot can change in a week, and it has. European politicians under the gun, the Greek Prime Minister retreats, and Italy's Prime Minister teeters on the brink. Here at home, we ask, will the dairy payout forecast by Fonterra dodge Europe's woes? And we take a look at the risks a deteriorating global outlook may pose for New Zealand's agriculture sector, primarily lower world prices for New Zealand's primary exports. But will shifting export markets, tight supply in some sectors, and the floating New Zealand dollar provide some support for prices over the longer term? Joining me with the latest information from ASB's October Rural Economic Update is ASB Chief Economist Nick Tuffley. Starting with foreign exchange and the state of the dollar, the dollar fell over September because of the Eurozone debt crisis, but bounced back in October. Nick? Yes, well, what we tend to find with our currency is when everybody's ducking for cover, we, we often find it's the US dollar strengthens, our own currency weakens. So we went from about 88 cents in, in early October when things look, looked okay to well below 80 cents as that fear started to pick up. And we have seen some recovery, so we're off the, off the, off the lows and around that 80 cent mark, so there's been some recovery. As generally there's been a little bit more at times work coming through in Europe on, on sorting out their situation. They've got a long way to go, but there has at least over the last couple of months been some signs they are taking the problem a little more seriously, even if uh, the, the solutions are still as nebulous uh, as they always seem to have been. We'll drill down into that in part two of the show, but let me ask you, short term, uh, what are you predicting for the New Zealand dollar? Uh, short term, um, I've got a trusty coin which I toss. It's not quite like that, but the realistically is is that from day to day, as uh, there's a bit of positivity one day, a bit of negativity, look, we're just in a volatile times at the moment. When we look ahead to next year, what we would expect with the New Zealand dollar against the US dollar is, is some modest strengthening from around the, the 80 cent mark towards the 84 mark, so a little bit higher than where we are. That's really once a lot of the dust set around Europe uh, settles, assuming of course it does. Okay, let's take a look now at your bank's uh, October Rural Economic Update. Overall, how did all of the commodities perform? I think we've seen, given the global backdrop of the last couple of months, things performing very, very well. Commodity prices have actually been very, very resilient. So a lot more concern globally about demand for commodities, and we've seen that a lot in the hard commodities and some of the more frequently traded commodities on exchanges in, in say, say, the US. And yes, we have seen a tiny bit of slippage in ours, but they've held up pretty well. Yeah, let's talk about dairy. It's down significantly over the past six months, correct? It is, but what's interesting, over the last couple of months, the, the declines we've seen in Fonterra's auction have been actually quite modest, and I think more than anything, it's the exchange rate's been a bit of a headache for Fonterra. Do you think there's any danger now with the Eurozone crisis uh, that, that it's going to impact on Fonterra's forecast? It's already down 45 cents, and that's worth, what, 700 million bucks to the New Zealand economy. It, it's not small cheese, if you like. It, it's, it certainly <laughs> isn't. I, I think where the, the payout is settled at the moment does look realistic, given where we expect we do expect prices will generally hold up. We'd be a bit more comfortable if we saw prices in US dollars start to lift a little bit with this payout. Now, with Euro I think we're, what we're finding is where, where the impact on dairy could be is, is as consumption or if consumption gets impacted a little bit in Europe, there's probably going to be a bit more export supply coming out of, say, Europe and also the US looking for homes. But I think for us, the key market, it's going to be China and, and wider Asia and how well demand there holds up. Now, some of the signs there are not so good because we have seen um, exports to China of things like whole milk powder um, ease back um, over the last six months. But I think that's the market we really need to keep an eye on uh, in terms of our, our dairy, it will be the big swing factor. And looking at it today, I mean, basically two factors at play, higher supply, weaker demand, including China. Yes, that, that's the thing. I think dairy is the one where probably the, the, the conditions haven't been as good as in the other commodities because we've had a good season here. Um, increased production in the US and the European um, finish to the season was very strong as well. So there have been a few headwinds for dairy, but prices to date, I think, relatively resilient despite that. Okay, beef prices remain unusually high. I can't figure this out. Well, what we've been watching for is there's been drought conditions in the US and we know there's uh, a lot of uh, cattle that are being hurriedly sent off on their, their last little trip, um, but it's taking a while to fatten them up. So that's delayed a bit of a 
an ex anticipated flow through of quite a bit of supply. So we are anticipating uh, a short term drop in beef prices, but again we would do expect that the prices will probably recover to some degree. And the type of beef we're sending there, um, the supplies of that are fairly tight in the US market. Interesting, it looks like uh, the US could surpass Brazil and Australia as the biggest beef exporter in the world. Uh, how do you figure that? Well, we're seeing that not just in beef, but other commodities. Uh, the US dollar is really weak. So um, one thing for the US, they're finding they're actually competitive in global markets again. So um, that's encouraging, I think, some of that US beef supply to head off overseas um, to some of those countries um, that are you know, big beef consumers. And wool, of course, continues to, d to beat the odds. Cotton's come way, way down. It continues to sit high. Uh, how do we do in October? Well, things have held up pretty well. I think we are very wary, though, that there is some scope for prices to, to ease back, given what we've seen with cotton prices, also oil prices being lower and, and what that does to synthetics. Also, the down under housing market, um, we're still pretty weak. We're seeing low construction. So in terms of demand for carpet, for example, uh, in the short term, that looks like it's going to be pretty weak. We do know there's going to be a lot of rebuilding coming through in, in Christchurch, which will help. But you know, that's, that's next year's story. Yeah, and yet prices, I think, are something like 35% higher for wool than they were a year ago. Uh, how long is that going to hold, are you picking? Well, the thing is, we are, we're actually surprised they've held up so well, so we do anticipate a bit of softness coming through. But generally, I think the story for our commodities is you know, a lot firmer on average going forward, even if we do see some easing back. Thanks, Nick. Coming up after the break, how's New Zealand holding up during these uncertain economic times? Around the world, financial markets remain on edge. Here at home, it's watch, worry and wait. Greece awaits a new prime minister and coalition government with new elections in February next year, all because the old prime minister decided to hold a referendum with his people on whether they should accept the latest bailout from their European neighbours. Talk about a crisis in confidence. What was he thinking? And then there's Italy. It's now overtaken Greece as the prime threat to global stability. The Eurozone's third largest economy is on its knees. But what's that all got to do with the price of avocados, you might ask? Well, nothing actually. They've rarely been cheaper in the supermarkets here, but low prices mean growers are making almost nothing as the industry faces its biggest ever crop. So answer this in our Farmers Facts and Figures quiz. How many million trays this season will avocado producers grow compared to last season? The answer when we return. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Money Talks. Just before the break, we asked you, how many million trades this season will avocado producers grow compared to last season? 5.8 million trays, almost double 3.1 million the year before. But export returns are averaging just 11 to $13 a tray, well down on the $20 a tray paid out in the last two seasons. Not so good. Joining us now is former BNZ chief economist Murray Weatherston, who's now a director of Financial Focus. Murray, is this a good time not to be a banker uh, somewhere in the world? I would imagine it's a very good time not to be a banker. Yeah. Can we talk about Greece now? Uh, the prime yeah. minister is out. Uh, he had this crazy idea that he would hold a referendum uh, yeah. to see whether his countrymen approved of him taking the latest bailout offer. Was the guy crazy? Was this a death wish? Um, no, I don't think it was. I think the politics there is you know, pretty tricky. Um, they're now going to go into a coalition of sorts for a period of time until they have an election. I, I personally think that Greece will just be a series of accidents waiting to happen. And uh, I think everybody will have their fingers crossed that you know, the big boom doesn't happen and they actually have to default. The problem is, of course, that uh, the elections are now not until February. Uh, it's almost like um, uh, they're just killing time. Do they have that time, Nick? I don't know that they do, and I think that was the thing with the referendum as well, that idea where if it had gone ahead, it was just opening up a massive amount of uncertainty, huge amount, which might have been hanging over until December and January. And a week, as we are still seeing, is a really long time with this crisis. So. The positive thing is, is they'll get through, accept the referendum that sets them up to getting the next lot of cash they need before the end of the year, but you've still got that uncertainty going forward about commitment to um, you know, getting on top of the fiscal situation, which you know, in my view is, Greece has been asked to do too much, and that's 
that's why I think some sort of restructure, one way or another, is inevitable, and we want to make sure that it's done orderly. So wanted, uh, one Greek prime minister. Uh, uh, what attributes would you put on that job description, Murray? Uh, what does the new guy or gal need to do uh, to make something happen? Well, I think that whoever that person is, they're going to have to be extremely lucky to keep all the you know, various interests together. Um, it's not easy for any politician, I think, you know, telling your people that it's going to be tough times for quite a long period of time to come. And I think they really need all the, you know, sh all the cards to fall in the right order. Um, I just think it'll be one mishap after another and the markets won't settle down for you know, quite some time because of it. Yeah, the fact is it, there's, what, 11 million people in total chaos there, certainly from an economic point of view. Interesting that hospitals, for example, have been cut back already by 40% the spending, and apparently HIV now is a real problem. Um, uh, you know, how long, realistically, can they carry on? Well, that's the, the thing why what they've been asked is the impossible. The, the Germans have treated this whole issue as if it's a case of uh, just no one really wants to lend them the, the money and it's a liquidity issue and you make up for the liquidity by making sure people can lend the money. But it's beyond that. I mean, it's just the point where the economy just cannot repay that sort of debt. You need to actually remove a big chunk of that debt burden so that they don't have to do so much of this cutting. Because it's, all it's doing is they were in recession last year, they're in recession this year, and they'll be in recession next year through trying to raise taxes and cut spending. And it's it's just too much and their economy just can't stand it and you need to get rid of that. And it, that's why there's a lot of social unrest, you know, the people in the streets are rioting because um, they are being asked to, you know, take a big burden. Now, you might say they borrowed the money or the government borrowed the money, uh, they've had the good times, now it's the bad times. I mean, in the old days, what would have happened, I think, is that their currency would have depreciated to bilio um, and then they would have had a chance to trade their way out. But since they're fixed into a euro um, at a pretty uneconomic level for them, um, they, I don't actually see how they can trade their way out of it. Let's go to crazy Italy. Uh, is it time for the Prime Minister there to say uh, arriva derci and, and, and to get out of the power seat? Well, he's eventually there. He went along and had his little meeting with the President, and I think the result of that was a press release saying that the Prime Minister will step down when they pass the um, austerity um, package that's coming up, I believe, next week. So, look, there's been multitudes of scandals one way or the other, um, corruption, um, interesting things involving parties, um, and, it, and it's basically what's coming down to is, is that the, the other politicians have simply just run out of confidence in them. That's what's bringing them back. Yeah, and yet here's a guy who has survived, what, 50 non-confidence votes so far. Here's a guy who is facing charges on tax fraud, bribery, and a sex scandal involving a 17-year-old girl. Mm. Uh, you know, he, he seems to be the Teflon man. But again, how long can they wait? They've got to take some action. This is an economy way bigger than Greece. Yeah, well, I think that's the state we're, we're at where the big thing Italy needs is to start giving people confidence confidence that it can repay its debt because it's seeing its bond yield start to decline and they need to start taking some action and give people that confidence. Correct. And the bond yield sitting at what? 6.7% and when That's it right. hits 7% we're talking about default territory. We're talking Portugal? Well, I don't, I don't necessarily think it's default territory uh, but it's, it's, it's at the stage where people uh, saying, hey, you know, we've had enough of lending you the money. I suspect if it was a real free market, their interest rate currently would be much higher than that. And it's because the ECB and others are out there, you know, supporting Italian bonds that the rate is actually as low as what it is. They've got something like 120% of GDP as debt they owe. I think it's something like 1.9 billion euros. Um, Greece is small beer compared with Italy. Is this a, a simply an unsolvable problem? It's kind of like the elephant in the room. Nobody's talking oh. about it. Can it be solved, really? Is well, it so big now yeah. and so complicated? If it was simple, it would have been solved already. And I think we're going to go from you know meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting, and there's you know some big hairy um, statements going to be made about what will and what won't happen. I mean, even with the Greece situation, where supposedly it was announced what was going to happen, all the details missing. Yeah. They, they actually haven't worked it out yet, and that, that just shows that it's actually quite a you know tough problem. So, so what do we can expect to see realistically over the next, let's say, couple of months uh, on the world markets? Well, I think there's just going to be one stumble from uncertainty or not. So we're going to go through these bouts where it looks like things are 
under control and getting better and then something will come along as we saw last week we just need one person to open his mouth and have a brain explosion and it sets sets things back quite a bit so look we've got some I think some key dates more in February we've got the Greek election well that's February is when it looks like they're going to decide what the IMF's role is going to be they've they've kicked for touch uh, in a way that would make uh, put any um, I, think, I think rugby world cup player to, to, to shame absolutely um, but what that means is is that we can't really be assured of any degree of certainty I think um, before February and possibly even longer so I actually think it'll be much 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 longer before the thing settles down I mean, it could actually be years and I think the markets will continue to be quite volatile I mean I heard just I was leaving home this morning um, the leader of the Greek opposition party was apparently saying he won't necessarily sign up to the austerity package. Well, yeah, you know, so it, it could be derailed at you know on any day, uh, except the politicians. I think will actually have a will to try to put the band-aids on for as long as they can. Yeah, and, and meantime, our politicians here at home, whether it's it's National Labour, any of the parties, they're really saying that uh, we're doing not too badly here. We're in control. I say we're not nearly as in control as they would like us to believe. Uh, your take on that? Yeah, well, uh, if you have a look at what our government deficit was in the last year, it was you know a humongous number. Uh, the fortunate thing was that the level of government debt wasn't very high to start with, and and so, you know, we we haven't got the problem. I mean, if Greece had a, or were, um, Italy had the same um, government deficit relative to GDP as we did, you know, they'd, everybody would be screaming from the rooftops. Yeah. Um, I think nationals or the current government's policy is to try to grow our way out of the problem, you know, with tax take uh, going up over time. Um, if the world remains pretty tough place, uh, it's going to be pretty hard to see that we'll get that growth and it wouldn't surprise me at all if the forecast that we've got of getting back to surplus um, don't get met. In fact, the, the timetable gets pushed out. Thanks, gentlemen. Coming up after the break, future proof on the highways and byways of the economic world. Buckle up as our experts take us along for the ride and point out what they'll be watching over the coming week. But first, apples for Australia are getting the third degree. Australian quarantine inspectors are taking up to an hour to inspect a carton of 78 apples. So answer this in our Farmers Facts and Figures quiz. How many of the 1,121 boxes of kiwi apples headed for Oz has been rejected since the export trade opened? Find out after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to Money Talks. Just before the break, we asked you how many of the 1,121 boxes of kiwi apples headed for Australia has been rejected since the export trade opened. 280 of those boxes have been turned back by the Aussies. That's almost a quarter of the export apples. And now it's time for Future Proof. What's coming up for our experts? And I know, Murray, you always keep a close eye on what they're doing over in the U.S. of A. That's right. Well, the Americans have been worried for quite some time why their economy can't you know, get a kick start away. And there's more and more people now starting to say it's it's the lack of activity in the housing sector. I mean, I, I looked at figures um, just this morning and house, uh, housing starts, you know, new buildings are running at about um, 500,000, 600,000 a year. Uh, for the last 20 or 30 years, it's averaged 1.5 million houses a year so they're down you know quite an enormous amount um, housing typically contributes about six percent to GDP it's now running at two percent for GDP and lots of people believe that until the housing sector starts getting underway the economy won't pick up at all now there were some unemployment figures out and on the one hand uh, it looked like it was slightly improved but on the other hand uh the, not the, good at all. The numbers are high. They're yeah. you know, running at 9% or something of that order. Yeah. Um, something like one in four householders is underwater on their mortgage. Um, house prices have fallen 30% in the last five or six years. And so that sector, there's lots of foreclosures. Um, and so until all that works its way out, it may be that the US economy doesn't get a, you know, up any decent head of steam at all. Yeah, and you know, the problem is everybody is fixated on Europe at the moment. The uh, United States has kind of taken a back seat, but it shouldn't, should it? This has an enormous impact on the global economy and for us here. Still the biggest biggest economy. I think the outlook isn't as dire as what it is in, in, in Europe, and I think you know, 
generally the expectations seem to be, yes, it will grow next year, but it's going to be probably about half what it it's probably capable of. We do need to be mindful of we've been looking at uh, European debt and focusing on it. Now we remember some minor events in July and early August involving the uh, US debt ceiling. Um, later this month and over December we are going to be going through the next round of that where there's a committee that has to come up with some spending cut recommendations and if they don't come to any agreement there are going to be some automatic across the board spending cuts put in place next year. So we're not done yet on US fiscal issues. Uh, there's still a little bit of water to pass under the bridge before Christmas. And Nick, uh, on Thursday, uh, the Reserve Bank brings out its financial stability report. As I understand it, this looks at how healthy our banks are in our financial systems. Tell me more. Yes, well, it's more looking at New Zealand, that, that, that financial system, the, the I guess it's the report card on that, the six monthly rec report card. Looking, I think, at New Zealand's um, overall economy from the context of that sort of financial vulnerability. And obviously there's going to be a lot of focus in Europe and the challenges in funding markets in, in Europe at the moment and some comments I think on the, 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 how the Reserve Bank sees the, the local banking market which you know, I think has um, over the last few years become less dependent on, on foreign funding um, and moving into a space where it's a lot more resilient to withstand another um, credit crisis uh, than it was back in 2008. So. Yeah. Let's look to those comments. Okay, uh, Murray, uh, looking to the election now, uh, because as a banker, I think you're not going to want to say too much about this, who you favour, but it looks like, uh, according to today's poll, that the national government will be ruling alone if it goes back in. Well, I, th I think one thing's very clear is national's going to be the largest party in Parliament. Uh, whether it is, gets enough to govern alone or not, I'm not sure. I think the way John Key's operated... Um, his political management is I think even if he did have enough to govern alone he would still want to garner some other parties in with him because next time he might actually need them you know he might not have a majority so I would expect him the, the way he manages things he, you know I, I wouldn't expect him to take the ball by the horns and say goody you know we can we can now rule alone I think he will still try to build in some other people into his government I mean you'd have to be you'd have to get some pretty good odds and you would have to be pretty optimistic to think that he's not going to be the Prime Minister after the next election interesting though they're still talking about selling off state assets uh, and yet 70 percent of New Zealanders don't like that idea uh, is he going to listen well, they sound like that's one of their key policy um, platforms that they're campaigning on, so you would expect that if they do get in and form a government that they will go ahead, ahead with that. You know, you camp campaign on something, you tend to go, uh, go through with it. I just want to make a general comment on where we see both the um, major parties going is in terms of looking at our, our fiscal prudence. Now is this Both going to be a, a diplomatic <laughs> comment or are you going to really tell us what you think? Uh, well, I think <laughs> what we are seeing is both of them are making that commitment that they're going to get us back into an operating surplus within a reasonable amount of time. 2014-15. Uh, 2014-15. Um, now it may take a bit of tweaking to do that but I think from external people looking into New Zealand they can probably see we have a, like a like credible, um, I guess, commitments to get our finances back into order. And I think that's a, a positive. Confidence is so important. And when you look at what's happening in, in Europe and the US, I think what's refreshing is that we have the two major parties do seem to be agreed on quite an important thing and, and committed to doing that. The one thing that worries me is that everybody's relying, it seems, all the politicians on the rebuild in Christchurch. But that's not going to help us uh, grow our exports, for example. What do we do about that? Well, that's where I think taking that long-term look, how can you make the economy perform better overall? How can you make sure that resources like capital and people are moving into the those sort of productive sectors, as we call it? So we've seen some changes made by this government. Both of the, gov the major parties are proposing policies that they see will move towards promoting that. They're taking different avenues. Now, it's a long-term game, um, but it's about making the right macroeconomic and micro, so like the tiny details, getting them right and encouraging a shift in the economy. You can't kind of command it, much as we would like to, but it's about setting the right incentives to encourage um, a, a gradual shift in our economy. And we're starting, but you know, there'll be a lot of work to do, and it's an ongoing job. You, know, you can't just stop and rest on your laurels, and that's where I think we're seeing mistakes in Europe where people have sat back and gone, we're in the euro now, I've got low interest rates, we don't have to worry about anything anymore. But if I could interpose a pessimistic note on that, the New Zealand economy has been, been they've been trying to transform it since at least 1984. Right? That, that was really what the you know, Rogenomics was all about trying to reform the economy, and now whatever it is, 
26, 30, 26 years later, you know, we're still talking about the same move that needs to, needs to happen. Thanks to my guests, Murray Weatherston and Nick Tuffley. Be sure to check out our website. Meantime, take a look at Moral Hazard and his take on the Greek debt crisis. Yes, the Greeks gave us Pythagoras and Euclid and Plato and other wondrous stuff. But balance in their national budget, their budget, their budget apparently is tough. They use derivatives from Goldman, from Goldman, from Goldman expenses to postpone. Had to go to France and Germany and Germany and Germany to get a bailout loan. Keep the faith. See you next time.